welcome to the Pooch Parenting Podcast, a podcast for parents with dogs. I'm Michelle Stern, a certified professional dog trainer, mom, and former teacher. Living with kids and dogs at the same time can feel like a circus. I know because I lived it too. Join us as we interview a variety of experts and parents to discuss topics that will make parenting with dogs easier, safer, and less chaotic. Also, you can love living with your dog again. I'll always keep it real which might even mean that you hear the messiness of life in the background on occasion, but at least you know you're not alone. Nice to see you again. I am sorry I have been gone for so long. I kind of lost my mojo for a little while, and then we made a very big decision that we are going to be leasing out our house in the Bay Area and moving up to our house that is in Sun River, Oregon. So we've been working on some logistics, We're up at our Oregon house now for the winter, and I am going to be picking up a new puppy soon. So I'm going to be getting on a plane and flying to Hawaii and picking up my new baby. So I've been giving a lot of thought lately into how one gets a new puppy or a new dog for a family and who makes that decision of which dog should be the one that you bring home. So interestingly enough, while this was all going on, I posted something on my Facebook page, my Pooch Parenting Facebook page. I have a series on there called the Unpopular Opinion Series, which tends to get a lot of attention, especially from people who like to argue or people who like to be right. But in any case, the most recent unpopular opinion post that I put up is related to choosing a dog. And so I wanted to share it with you here and then talk a little bit about the implications. So the post says, unpopular opinion. If you have kids and dogs and are choosing a new dog, pick the one that favors your kids over you when they meet. Now, this was not my idea originally. This idea came from Trish McMillan when I interviewed her a while ago for an earlier episode of my podcast about how to choose a good family dog. And I loved what she said. We were talking about meeting dogs in a shelter environment. And typically what happens in a shelter is people come through and they look at the dogs that are available, either in person or online ahead of time. And then they come to the shelter to meet the dog in person. So some people are browsing through the dogs and they ask if they can meet the dog that speaks to them in some way. So maybe something is particularly cute or they have always been looking for a dog that is a certain breed mix or something like that. And in some cases, families will come through and they will look at an entire litter of puppies and then they attempt to choose one. But what Trish was suggesting is that if you are a family and you've got young children, then the dog that you want to bring home to live with you should be a dog that actively engages your children as opposed to avoiding the children to say hello to you, the adult, first. The reason she said this is because it's really common for dogs to be uncomfortable around young children because they're quite unpredictable. And sometimes what can happen is uh, a dog may speak to one of the adults in the house and we choose that dog and bring it home and then find out that the dog is avoiding your kids or hiding from your kids, is afraid of your children or, you know, perhaps actively dislikes them and then tries to do some inappropriate behaviors to protect itself or defend itself, depending on the situation. And so what Trish had to say here is that if you are choosing a dog that really loves your kids, that comes up to them, greets them, says hello to them, doesn't avoid them in any way, then you could possibly be setting your family up for success. Now, of course, I probably wouldn't let any dog be completely unrestrained around your kids for the first time. You don't know this dog. Oftentimes at shelters, and I'm speaking from experience from when I worked in a shelter, Um, Oftentimes, the adoption volunteers who are introducing you to a dog at the shelter may not be the person who knows the dog best and may not be the person who did the behavior evaluation and wrote up the profile for the dog. So sometimes the people who are in charge of adoptions are 
really not quite as familiar with the dog and the dog's personality and needs, et cetera, as some of the other volunteers are or the behavior staff might be. So that said, you know, somebody might tell you this dog is good with kids, but I would rather not just assume that they know what they're talking about because the stakes are too high to make that assumption. However, there can be some body language signals that you can look for that can tell you how a dog is feeling. Now, on my unpopular opinion post, somebody made a really, really super comment, and I wanted to address it um, because what she talked about was Um, this was a comment from Angela. And Angela said, would most pet parents be capable of determining that a dog is really happy to be around the children? And then what she says is, I wonder if any would misinterpret anxiety, such as jumping, licking, or whining, as the dog being more attentive or favoring the child. And I'm really glad, and thank you, Angela. Um, I'm really grateful that you mentioned that because it did make me realize that we sometimes take for granted that um, people can recognize body language when in fact misunderstanding how a dog is feeling is often one of the greatest factors in behavior that can be dangerous, um, especially to children. So for example, zoomies, a lot of us have seen our dogs getting the zoomies or you've seen it happen um, in movies or wherever, and it's adorable and it looks really fun. And the zoomies often are a dog having a really great time. However, sometimes a dog can do the zoomies if they're feeling a little bit frantic or stressed out. Also, a dog may lick you when they are giving, as we say, kisses. But sometimes a dog will lick as a stress response. And that could mean that they're licking at you in a slightly more forceful way as if to push you away. Or it could be that they're licking their lips because something in the environment around them makes them uncomfortable. And we might misinterpret those signals as the dog offering kisses to our children or licking their lips because they're thirsty, when in reality, the dog is struggling with how it feels. And we might be able to alleviate some of that stress by giving the dog more space, for example. So I really appreciate that Angela reached out and made that comment because it did make me realize that this is something that is important to talk about. Now, there were some other really great comments, though, about how we should choose dogs. And I want to dive into the ways that people get dogs and how we should make a choice on which dog we bring home. So I want to address a few of these. So I am getting a new puppy soon. I'm very, very excited about it. And I'm sure we will have future podcast episodes that are about her and some of the shenanigans that we are up to together and some of the management challenges that I might be experiencing, even though I'm a trainer. So let me just start by explaining I'm I'm getting a Border Terrier puppy, and I have a Border Terrier now. He's three years old. His name is Pippin. You've probably heard me mention Pippin before, so he's going to be a big brother. And we're getting a little girl, and I'm naming her Olive. So I will make sure that you can see plenty of puppy spam if you go to my Facebook or Instagram on at Pooch Parenting. But regardless, so I'm a dog trainer. And a lot of people have been making the assumption um, that I'm the one who picks which puppy out of the litter I will be bringing home. But in reality, that's not what's happening in my case. There are many breeders that let the future puppy guardians decide which puppy they want to bring home. But in my experience, a lot of very good breeders, very thoughtful breeders, experienced breeders, make the choice for the families. And they're able to do that because they have been living with these puppies day in, day out, 24 hours a day from the moment they're born. And the puppies often don't go home until they're between eight and 10 weeks of age. So that's a lot of time where these breeders are getting to know the puppies. They get to know their quirks, whether or not they're confident in most circumstances how resilient they are, how quickly they recover if they're startled, how they respond to having items taken from them. And a really good breeder will be 
um, implementing a variety of strategies to help those puppies be even more resilient. They will teach them that if I have to take an item of yours, that it's not a bad thing because I'm going to trade and I will always give you something else of value. And this helps puppies to not guard their resources, which is very helpful if you're going to be putting a puppy in a home that has kids because kids often pick up toys and some puppies don't necessarily like that and, and kids don't want to share and dogs don't want to share. And so sometimes we can get into a bit of a, a prickly situation. So in my case, I chose a breeder very carefully. I was looking at another breeder and had a really negative experience. And I've been talking to this breeder um, for probably 10 months now. And we talk a lot. She knows the kind of life that I live. She knows how active we are. She knows that I would love a dog that's resilient enough and social enough to be a therapy dog. So she's pretty clear on what my goals are for this dog. Now, she also knows that I don't want to show this dog. So she had some specialists come in and evaluate all of the puppies based on structure, temperament, et cetera. And she decided which puppy she was going to keep based on structure and potential breeding um, ability to breed to the breed standard. So something a little bit more physically based, perhaps. But then she told me which puppy I would be getting based on a lot of the personality characteristics that I was looking for. Now, just because you're working with a breeder does not mean that your breeder is of the same caliber that this particular breeder is. There are lots of websites out there in the world that look amazing and that may make it look like the puppies are living a great life inside a home with children, etc. But they are very misleading. And some of those are actually puppy mill websites where those puppies are sort of mass produced. They're kept in outdoor enclosures, oftentimes wire crates, cages, et cetera, um, with very little socialization, very little thought to the genetics and the temperament uh, and health, emotionally and physically health, physical health um, of the parent dogs. And so they may have a very pretty website, but it doesn't mean that the same level of thought and intentionality is going into creating each of these puppies. And so in that case, um, again, they may choose which puppy you get, but that's because you're never going to their facility. You're not meeting the parents. They're putting that puppy on an airplane and you have no idea that that puppy grew up in perhaps filthy conditions, for example. So again, before, you know, you may be comfortable with a breeder choosing the dog for you, really get to know your breeder Zoom with them, FaceTime with them, get a good look at the parent dogs if possible. If you can go and visit the breeder, please do so and meet the potential parents of your future puppy. So these are some suggestions if you are working with a breeder, but a very good one, a reputable one, ideally will help you to make a good choice on which puppy you're going to get based on the type of lifestyle and family you live. In. Now, shelters are another way that people get dogs. Um, the shelter, not all shelters, again, are created equal. Some shelters are underfunded and they don't necessarily have specific adoption staff and they may be mostly run by volunteers. But the people who know the dogs the best are often the volunteers who go in and walk the dog or the kennel staff, actually, who go in and clean up and feed the animals because they see them so regularly. But unfortunately, in not all cases, the people who know the dog the best are not necessarily the people who interact with you, the adopter. And so it's worth asking a lot of questions. Who wrote the adoption profile? How did they determine the information that went into the adoption profile? So these are all things to think about. Now, a lot of rescue organizations, they don't have a shelter type of setting where the dogs are kept in kennels or runs, but a lot of rescues have their dogs in foster homes. And this is one of my favorite ways to get a rescue dog or a shelter type of dog is if it's in a foster type of environment because it's living in a home with a family. And so they may or may not have children. So you need to ask those questions. 
but they know what it's like to live with this dog on a daily basis. How do they act around food? How do they act around toys? How do they act when somebody rings the doorbell? What are they like on leash? How do they act when they see other dogs, etc.? So a foster home is basically just like another home like yours, but it's temporary and it's a really loving, safe place for a dog to be that is not in a stressful shelter environment until you get a good match with an adopter. So if you are looking to get a rescue type of dog, ask a lot of questions, go and meet the dog and see how they act. You know, of course, again, in this case, I would love to see the dog really go and engage with soft, loose body language with your kids. And of course, say hello to you too. We don't want you to bring home a dog that's afraid of your partner, for example, but we want to intentionally choose a dog that loves your kid. Now, a lot of people said to me, well, you know, I don't actually care if my dog loves my kids. What I need is a dog that doesn't get up in my kid's business and a dog that if it's stressed will walk away. And I agree with that. I mean, I do think that that's an important distinction that ideally we want a dog who recognizes when they're uncomfortable, who walks away when they're stressed, but not all dogs are going to do that. And oftentimes that is a learned skill. So a dog may be in conflict because it may want to be near you because it feels safe near you, but that might mean that it's near your child. And so even though the dog might be stressed around your child, they don't leave because they want to be near the comfort of you. Right. So there's a whole variety of different ways that dogs can behave when they are around children. Ambivalence is good. I don't mind that. I often tell my clients who are expecting that I would love for their dog to just ignore the baby. I think that's great. But this particular podcast episode is not assuming that you're about to have a baby and you're bringing home a new dog. I think that would be a lot for you to handle. This is more if you have children who are, you know, toddlers on up, and we want to make sure that you are choosing a dog that would be happy to live in a family. Now, I want to just share a quick story about a client that I saw yesterday. She brought in a dog that had a a troublesome past, and the dog did not do very well with her toddler. And so you might just think, okay, well, that's a bad fit and you shouldn't have this dog. And that's entirely possible. That is definitely possible. But she didn't really have anyone helping her with this dog. So she got the dog from a rescue who needed an emergency foster placement. And she didn't get a lot of information about the dog. And so she took the dog in to give it a safe place to be. And then some of the trouble began after that, right? And so it was really difficult because she didn't get the support from a great foster home that could give her a ton of information because she was stepping in in an emergency. So sometimes people bring in a dog because they're such generous, kind people that they're trying to help the dog and trying to save them and and do a really good mitzvah, as we say. But I do want to give you permission to acknowledge that if the dog is causing your family members a lot of stress, if the dog is scaring your child, if the fact that you're so worried about safety is impacting your ability to parent, that it is absolutely okay to find a new home for that dog. You are not a failure if you need to find a new home because that dog is too risky for the safety, physical safety or emotional safety of any of your family members. This is not a failure. And sometimes my clients with the biggest hearts in the whole world are just so sad to think that society is considering that they're giving up on this dog. But in reality, in my opinion, I believe they are not at all giving up on the dog, but what they're doing is they're doing such a kindness to that dog 
to give it a better chance of succeeding in a different environment. Because some dogs find it so stressful to live with young children that their quality of life is not what it should be. And so I just want to give permission out there that I, I love helping families to try to really figure out if you've made a right choice. Ideally, I'll work with you before you get the dog in the first place so we can really nail down what you should be looking for. But sometimes you don't even realize that that kind of service is available, especially from one mom to another. And sometimes you just need someone who's going to listen to you and support you and not judge you if you feel like you're in over your head because it's really common because parenting kids is really hard and parenting dogs is really hard. And the combination of the two is a lot. So who should pick your next dog? Well, I think the dog should have some say into whether or not it is comfortable around all of the family members. If you're working with a really excellent breeder, the breeder has so much experience and knows these dogs better than anyone, and they can help to identify which puppy, if any, of that litter would be suitable for your family. If you're working with a rescue organization, ideally, you'll find one that has foster families who know the dogs really well as well. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I am available. I do online consults with people all over the world. So please reach out if you have any questions or if you want to set yourself up for success if you're going to add a dog in the future. I hope you found this helpful. Take care. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and review it on your favorite podcast player. But even better, please tell people about Pooch Parenting because so many people don't know that support like this exists. In particular, you can tell your obstetrician, your pediatrician, and all of your friends from your mother's groups. Nobody needs to do this alone. I'm here for you. Again, for more information, please visit poochparenting.net and just know that it does take a village and I'm here to support you all the way. Take care and thanks again for listening.